confirmation bias has been around for an incredibly long time. And this verse actually in the Bible, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, is an indicator of confirmation bias being something that was taught in the early churches. This letter that is attributed to Paul, but not guaranteed that Paul actually wrote it, but um, most scholars accept that half of the letters written by Paul that are claimed to have been written by Paul were actually written by followers of Paul and not Paul himself. So this is one of those that kind of goes both ways, possibly could have been written by someone that is identified as being Paul or it was written by one of Paul's followers. But be that as it may, the Christian church had already been established in Corinth by this time frame that this writing was done. Now, in this writing, what it's looking for is confirmation bias. And the person is trying to apply this to today. And many pastors will apply this to today that people who do not believe in the cross are actually uh, those who don't understand the power of God. But what is actually teaching is that for those people at that time, it is saying that the Greeks, the Jews, the Kemetics, the everybody else, the Romans would not have looked upon Jesus dying on the cross for the sin of man as a strong God, but would look at that as a foolish belief. So that's why it's saying that dying on the cross was is of the foolish that they look at it like it's foolish because in their time frame, gods were these very strong opposing figures who could not die at the hands of man. That the only way for a god to die would be at the hands of another god or possibly at the hands of a demigod. So to the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, a god dying on the cross is a very weak god. Because he died at the hands of man. Follow that up with the aspect for them. Um, they are trying to tell the people who believe the Corinthians who are Christians, the Corinthians, the those Corinthians who are Christian, because not all Corinthians were Christian, but trying to tell the Corinthians who were Christians that to hold strong, hold strong to their faith, because their faith and believing that opposed to what the general consensus is about a God is actually a demonstration of power that he would sacrifice himself for the sins of man because for the everybody else the overwhelming consensus at that time frame gods did not sacrifice themselves for the benefit of man uh, for the wages of man's sin in order for a man to have his sins removed, they had to perform sacrifices or they had to perform great deeds, great acts in order to alleviate, uh, elevate themselves up to a righteous point. So they would have thought of this as being a weak thing. And they're trying to reaffirm to those Corinthians, because at this time frame, the Corinthian church was going through a bunch of struggles. And so it was a form of confirmation bias to make sure that they just continue to believe and accept what these teachings are so that they will continue to stand steadfast in these teachings. Now, the church was going through the trouble of convincing women to stop adorning themselves with gold and braiding their hair and looking all good. It was trying to convince women that convince the men to hold on to patriarchal mentality and having women be silent in the churches and do not speak. So they were trying to organize the Corinthian church in their patriarchal system at the time. And by telling them that their God is strong through this sacrifice and not weak through this sacrifice was a way of reaffirming to them and keeping them steadfast in this religion. Now, how does that work today? Uh, because it was calling the wisdom of those people foolishness or weak and that this God will prevail. That same mentality of Christians is still reigning today. Whereas when I talk about the Kabbalion, when I talk about Hermeticism, when I talk about alchemy, um, when I talk about you having dominion over your life by raising your kundalini or opening your third eye or opening your chakras, anything of that nature, that this will be foolish wisdom, uh, that what you should just believe in is the fact that 
some dude died on the cross for you and was a human sacrifice, a human blood sacrifice for you. Where else, if you look at that in any other context, you would say it's demonic. But in this case, it's not. It's supposed to be looked upon as the true power of this God. Um, but if you find that in any other case, where it's like Kali was in the Indus religion, Kali was going around killing every, she was going for, she had a reason at first, to go out and kill demons. And there's a story in the comedic where one of Ra's daughter, I forgot the deity's name. She has the lion, a lioness head that they were killing all these demons. But then that bloodlust caused them to start killing all the regular people as well. So as Kali started killing all the regular people and I forget the deity, the Egyptian deity starts killing all the regular people. Uh, in the Kali story, Brahma, her husband has to come and lie himself at her foot in order to bring her into a conscious state to stop. And then she was able to stop. But that's how they view powerful gods and how they would respond and how they would react. That they would sacrifice um, themselves, but they never sacrificed themselves. They just kind of like put themselves in front. And I think Ra was the one that came and, and stopped his daughter from killing all the people. And so Ra had to come and somewhat sacrifice himself in order to save humanity. So those were common tropes or common motifs that was around. So this was used as another common trope, common motif, but it can only be done by another God. And since Jesus was brought at the time frame of Corinthians being written, there was no Trinity, but he was a, a, a son of God, which would a benign Elohim as they would have thought of him um, to more like an angelic being. So it took someone of that power in order for them to do it. Now, once the Trinity became a part after the third <clears throat> and the fourth century, <clears throat> when you have the doctrine of the Trinity, and then he becomes God, saving all the people by sacrificing himself to himself in a human sacrifice. Uh, in today's world, men like me, women like me, will look at that teaching as being, you know, foolish to believe in that. Uh, so, <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a one of those. This scripture can still be used today, in order to make people stay steadfast in believing something instead of having facts about something. Because the facts are, you determine what your life is. The facts are, you are the Godhead within your own life. You control the vibration of your life. You control the manifestation of whatever happens at the end of this life it is not controlled by some other deity it is not controlled by some sacrifice that was made if you want to become a sinless person all you have to do is start treating everybody the exact same way you would desire to be treated for yourself yourself because at that point would you murder yourself would you steal from yourself would you steal from anybody else would you murder anybody else if those are things you don't want done towards you it's not. So therefore, you will become sinless. You don't need some savior to come and save you. The savior is within yourself. It's within you. So go save yourself. And remember always, you have to free yourself to be yourself because your greatness is non-negotiable. Good journey, good vibration.